Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar on carbon farming with compost with Cala Rose Ostrander of the Marin Carbon Project in California. I'm Brenda Platt, the director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your host and facilitator today. This webinar is the second in a new series we've launched focused on compost climate connections. Our first one we held on September 17th with Dr. Sally Brown of Washington State University. And that one focused on how compost sequesters carbon and also covered the other ecosystem benefits um, it delivered. We have at least um, three more scheduled after today. Uh, the one on October 23rd will be with Jessica Chiartas of UC Davis, Digging Deeper, How Compost and Cover Crops Sequester Soil Carbon. Jessica will share the results of a recently published 19-year study, which showed that compost is a key to storing carbon in semi-arid cropland soils and a strategy for offsetting carbon dioxide emissions. That'll be followed by Shasha Kramer with Soil Haiti and um, Rebecca Riles of the U University of California. And they'll be talking about using compost for ecological sanitation in Haiti to both mitigate and adapt to climate change. That'll be November 6. And then uh, the next one that we have scheduled after that is Carbon Farming Trials in Colorado, which I think will be of particular interest to a lot of you since it's a great follow on to to today's conversation about carbon farming with compost. So Dan Mace from EcoCycle and Mark Easter with the Natural Resource um, Ecology Lab uh, will be talking about the work they've been doing with carbon farming pilot projects in Boulder County in the city of Boulder. And they are adapting the science used in the Marin Carbon Project for the Rocky Mountain climate. And their web webinar will explore two of the pilot projects now underway in the county and city of Boulder and agricultural open space. So if you've registered for this webinar, we will send you info on the upcoming ones, but you will need to register for each one individually. Um, as the next slide shows, ILSR has a wide range of webinars just focused on composting, and we like to share working models and tips for replication. Most of our uh, webinars, or many of them, I should say, support community-scale composting, such as um, the spotlight we have in the bottom middle there on um, how to structure your entity. We won't be addressing today the importance of a distributed and diverse infrastructure for composting, so I just want to say a word about that now, since we believe here at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance that supporting a network of decentralized facilities, you know, that is home composting, community scale, on-farm, as well as commercial scale, supporting that diversified network is really critical. And we tend to focus a lot on community scale operations because they can be brought on faster than their industrial scale counterparts. And they also play a vital role in building community equity, returning compost to local soils, engaging and educating the community, dealing with food access uh, issues, food deserts, food sovereignty, and, um, and of course, creating local jobs. So there's many reasons to support a distributed infrastructure. Our webinars are recorded, so check them out. The next slide shows how you can access the webinars on our webpage if you go to ilsr.org slash composting and under the composting resources tab on the, the right um, column there to scroll down to get to webinars. We have 19 already um, and check them out. One thing we also have is you might be able to see from the slide is we also have a composting for community podcast series and we just um, uh, published the last one on how composting can create a regenerative food system featuring Rust Belt riders in um, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. So check out our podcast too. Um, as the next slide features a report that I did, gosh, 11 years ago already, it's hard to believe, called Stop Trashing the Climate. And I'm, I'm showing this just to point out that we've been working on the impact of, of trash and consumption and food waste and yard waste and plastics on climate for far too long. And you know this report is just as relevant today as it was 11 years ago when we, we published it. One key finding uh, that we had was composting increases carbon storage in soils and improves plant growth, which in turn expands carbon sequestration. So we concluded that compost is absolutely vital to restoring the climate and our soils. And this was before the marine carbon 
project. Um, we were lucky enough a few years later when we did the 2014 report, the state of composting in the US, what, why, where, and how, that we were able to cite the research findings of the Marin Carbon Project among the growing body of evidence demonstrating the effectiveness of compost to store carbon in soil. And interestingly enough, you're going to hear about the findings directly from or the research and what's going on with the Marin Carbon Project in a few minutes. But one of the things that the Marin Project did was, you know, test a half inch of compost on, on rangeland. And in this report, I ran some numbers that if we applied that half inch of compost to the 99 million acres in the US, US cropland that's eroding above soil tolerance levels, meaning the ability of, of the soil to sustain itself in the future is seriously at risk, that if we did that half inch just on those 99 million acres, we would need 3 billion, 3 billion tons of compost. We don't have that. So this, this work and, all, and, and, and the work in this series that you'll be hearing at really underscore how we have no time to waste when it comes to building the composting infrastructure and investing in healthy soils. And this is the, actually the concluding paragraph of that whole 100 page or so report. And the last sentence I think tells you a lot that this just underscores the need to reinvigorate the movement for a national soils policy in the US. So um, before we get started with today's feature presentation, uh, we're just going to run a few polling questions. Um, and so hopefully we won't have any uh, technical issues with that. So uh, one question we have is, did you join or listen to the first recording in this uh, webinar series, the one with Dr. Sally Brown last month, that was September 7th? Yes or no? And wait a few seconds. We like to have at least 80% of you voting. Thank you. And it looks like hmm, the percentages are not. OK, so yep. So the results are 56% um, were on it. So that's good, almost, two, uh, almost 2 thirds. And no, OK, good. So uh, the next polling question is why did you join today's webinar? So your choices are, I've heard of the Marin Carbon Project and want to learn more. I want to share, better share the climate benefits of composting. I love all ILSR's webinars. And the last one had to be cut for brevity, but it was really like, I'm really stressed out about the climate and I can't sleep and I want to do something about the climate crisis. And you can select all that apply. All right, let's show the results. So, all right. Um, okay, almost 75%. I want to better share the climate benefits of composting. All right, well, I think you'll be able to after this. So the, the, we have three more questions and this have to do for those of the two thirds of you, well, anybody can vote, but we asked three questions from Sally Brown's um, webinar September 17th. So if you're interested in any of the uh, the data here, go back and check that out. It's recorded. So what is the ecosystem services value to use compost on one hectare of land? And by the way, this is based on degraded urban soil. And when you add uh, compost to degraded urban soil, it really transforms the soil from low functioning to high functioning. So this takes into account some of the ecosystem services and the value of that, that Sally, Dr. Brown covered last month. So let's just see, you can guess what number she shared with us. And all of you can vote. So <clears throat> we have 60%, let's just get this up a little higher. All right, let's show the results. Sorry to cut some people off, but um, so the answer was $410 per ton of compost. There are other values that she covered, like the physical labor and health, so check it out. But it was uh, $410 per ton. Okay, so the next one I think you'll find really interesting. Um, soil formation um, is to create, to form soil, it's 0 0.003 inches per year. So how long 
will it take to build six inches of topsoil? No taking out your calculators, please. Although it looks like some of you may have. <laughs> All right, let's show the results. Looks like most of you are getting this. The answer is 1800 years. That's a long time. So a final question on this is compost can build six inches of topsoil in one month, one year, or three years. All right, let's show the results. And the answer is one month. Sally Brown shared with us that compost can build topsoil, six inches of topsoil in one month. Pretty amazing. So the wonder of compost, we have a lot of work to do to introduce the wonder of compost to everybody. All right, so um, while uh, my team is handing over the controls to Calla Rose. I'm going to inter introduce her. So, um, and by the way, um, in your webinar, go to webinar uh, control panel or panel, uh, you'll, there's a section there, questions. You can type your question at any time during the webinar. Uh, we're going to save them to the end. Calla Rose is going to talk for about um, an hour, and so that should leave us plenty of time for questions and answers. So, um, so carbon farming involves implementing practices that are known to improve the rate at which carbon dioxide is removed from the atmosphere and converted to plant material and soil organic matter. For more than a decade, the Marin Carbon Project has demonstrated that managing for carbon can actually increase the system capacity to hold even more carbon. And its first experiments involved applying a thin layer of compost to grazed rangeland. Since 2013, Calla Rose Strander has worked to support the advancement of carbon farming, compost production, climate beneficial material economies in, in um, California. She has um, been with the Marin Carbon Pro Project practically from its inception in partnership with John Wick and other partner organizations. She has supported the successful scaling up of regenerative agricultural in, agriculture in California. She specializes in climate change and ag policy, science communications, and movement building. Before that, Calla Rose served as the climate change projects manager for the city and county of San Francisco, where she created and managed internal sustainability and greenhouse gas reporting systems and inventories. Um, and she's been involved with San Francisco Carbon Fund and the community-wide cl climate planning. She also did similar work with the can uh, Cannery Initiative at the city of Aspen before that, where she co-authored Aspen's first climate action adaptation plans. And she created the Z Green Green Business and Events Program and launched the first municipal carbon credit program in the county. I am so thrilled to have Calla Rose join us today. So welcome, Calla Rose. And um, uh, we are waiting to view your screen. So I'll just let you know when it's up. It'll probably just take a few minutes. Thanks so much, Brenda. I really am um, happy to be here and thrilled to see all of the other names on um, the uh, on the list. So it looks like we're having a little bit of trouble with the screen. Yeah, just let's mm. just see. I'm waiting to view. There we oh, go. There we go. Yay! All right. So we can see your screen and you sound fine. So take it away. Great. Okay. So. Um, just going back to that, it's exciting to see all the names that you all have on your webinar series, really wonderful people in the field. And I am blessed to get to work with almost all of them. And uh, it's it's great to see the recognition that compost is starting to get within the climate change community um, and also within the agricultural communities. Uh, so we've really gone a long way. And since those reports that you all were putting out, uh, even though a lot of the information is the same, we do have some new information and we've definitely had some folks who have been communicating it in a, in a really specific way that's helped that information get out there. So I just wanted to start and make a slight modification to my um, intro there. So I 
have not been with the Moon Carbon Projects uh, since its beginning. I joined them about five years in, and I did watch them while I was at the city and county of San Francisco, and I had never been so impressed with a group of folks before. These people called, um, they asked us questions. I'd actually talked to John Wick, the start of the project, and he pr announced to me that they were going to make carbon credits from rangelands, and I told him all the reasons why that would be very challenging. Um, and five years later, they came back and said, well, we did the science, um, we did the modeling, we've built some structures around it, we've created this thing called carbon farming, and we built a protocol um, with American Carbon Registry for carbon offsets. Uh, it was very impressive, and I was really excited to get to go work with John. Um, I should also specify, just for clarity's sake, that the Marin Carbon Project only is focused on work in Marin. There are a group of organizations that make up the Marin Carbon Project, some of which focus on work outside of Marin, and I have been involved in helping to take the model of carbon farming that the Marin Carbon Project built, as well as the advancement of compost, which is so key to that carbon farming model, and scale it up outside of Marin. So people also think like, oh, Marin Carbon Project is doing work in Colorado. Well, no, Marin Carbon Project only does the work in Marin, and then there are many different organizations, myself included, who are surrounding or part of that project um, that then take the work out into the world. So I am really excited uh, to be talking with you all today, and I wanted to kind of back up a little bit from the nitty gritty and start off with kind of this big picture. Uh, it's this big picture that's really helped us tell this story about how our planet works and the and really important role um, that compost and humans have in that. So what you see in front of you obviously is a picture of the sun. Um, all of our life on this planet, all of the energy on this planet comes from the sun. We're all solar powered systems. Uh, I think as we know, but I think it's important to remember that when we are um, eating food, when we are wearing clothing, when we are burning fossil fuels, we are connected ultimately back to that source of the sun. And um, we've really been thinking about climate change in, as, a, as, a, um, as a form of pollution, the resulting of, of a carbon pollution. But what I wanna talk to you about now really is about the carbon cycle. And I think when we begin to look at the planet, the carbon cycle, the water cycle, nutrient cycles, and we see these circular systems, we begin to be able to place ourselves within them in a much more appropriate and beneficial way. So everything starts with the sun. Um, the light of that sun then comes to our blue planet, uh, which is covered, as we know, in water, uh, which gives rise to life. And that life emerged from the oceans and came onto land. And we have plants. Now plants take that energy of the sun and using water and minerals in the soil create carbohydrates. It's important to note that all of the carbon and carbohydrates comes from the air and nowhere else. You might think like, oh yeah, well of course I know that. But in a day and age where we're talking a lot about carbon sequestration technology, it's just kind of fun to keep in mind that actually Anything that makes carbohydrates is the most powerful form of carbon sequestration technology we have on the planet, and that's fueled by photosynthesis. Okay, so we're talking about this carbon cycle, and that's um, really what we've seen is that you know humans eat the plants, animals eat the plants, humans eat the animals, so we're in this larger cycle of life, this larger carbon cycle. Now humans have kind of broken this carbon cycle in that we've put it out of balance. Maybe out of balance is a better way. We burn a huge amount of fossil carbon, as you all are aware, and that moves carbon up from the lithosphere um, from the, and from the fossil pools into the atmosphere, um, imbalancing our climate. Now, a certain amount of that carbon is absorbed back into living systems through that photosynthetic process um, on the land and in the ocean. At the end of the day, about 44% or more is left in the atmosphere. It depends on if it's an El Nino year, uh, if the forests are dry. Um, so we have this sort of you know, release of carbon, and then we have this uptake of carbon by the oceans and the plants. And in fact, 
um, those plants and the oceans are taking up so much of our carbon uh, that they're, they have really slowed down climate change. In addition to the heat that the ocean has absorbed, which has also been slowing down the climate change associated with how much carbon we've put into the atmosphere. So many of you may be familiar with this. It's a very famous climate change slide. It's Keeling Curve. Dr. Keeling uh, set up an observation on the top of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and he um, uh, created this kind of classic curve we all know, and it shows that the annual concentration of parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going up, and that every year it goes up more, um, and that those concentrations of carbon are really leading to uh, the climate change effects that we're seeing um, today. Now, the idea with drawdown um, or uh, you know, stopping climate change or rebalancing the carbon cycle is that every year we put a bit, little bit less carbon into the atmosphere. We burn fewer fossil fuels. We don't burn so many forests. We don't clear so much land. Um, we really reduce the amount of carbon that we're releasing into the atmosphere. And at the same time, we sequester more of it in the land base. So how do we get even more uh, of that? So 56% of the carbon is sequestered by the land base. How do we get that land base to increase its sequestration? How do we get waterways or oceans to increase sequestration? It's gonna be a little bit tricky with the oceans because a lot of their systems are starting to collapse. You have ocean acidification. Um, but the good news is with the land, we really can continue to increase and sequester carbon. So that's this idea of drawdown. It's really like, let's put less carbon into the atmosphere and sequester more of it in our land base. John Wick, who's the co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project, has this really great quote, and I think it's important to think about in the same way that all of the carbon and carbohydrates comes from the air, you can also think about the fact that agriculture is sort of the act or the business of moving carbon between carbon pools, so from the atmosphere to the biosphere, to the lithosphere, the soil pools, to produce quality things like food, fuel, fiber, and flora products. So again, that process of photosynthesis and then the human management of photosynthesis is done through agriculture. So our largest way of managing photosynthesis directly is through agriculture and it's something that happens on a daily basis all around the globe. So this idea is like let's use agriculture as a form of managing the cycling of carbon um, in addition to reducing our emissions. Let's also use this tool that we already have and work with on a daily basis to move some of that carbon out of the atmosphere and into the soil. Now, the great thing about doing this is that unlike more carbon in the atmosphere, more carbon in the soil is good for us. Um, carbon is a keystone uh, in the soil system. It's also the building block of life. We are all carbon-based life forms and other elements um, on the planet organize around carbon. So when you increase that carbon content in the soil, you do get all of these other stacking functions that surround it. So that's why we talk about carbon as being key to soil health, because it helps feed the microbiological community, because it attracts and stabilizes other nutrients, and because it has impacts on water. Again, this is a very general principle, but I think it's a good way to think about climate change. We're thinking about climate change as, oh, our carbon footprint, I have to reduce my carbon footprint. Well, yes, we do have to reduce our carbon footprint, but I also want us to all keep in mind that we live within this very large and living cycle, the carbon cycle, which is driven by living systems. Now, people often forget, because it's not included in the Kyoto Protocols, that water is actually the single largest greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is water vapor. Water vapor cycles very rapidly, um, and it also helps to heat the atmosphere. Um, more carbon in the atmosphere equals more water in the atmosphere. Uh, more water and more carbon in the atmosphere, like I said, equals more heat. This is also, and um, the water loading capacity increases. So this is why, part of the reason why we get more intense storms. We have warmer oceans, but we also have the atmosphere holding more water. So in California, we get something called the Pineapple Express that comes across the Pacific Ocean. 
and then it dumps um, it, it just dumps water on all of us. Now that has gotten more intense over the years and that in part is because the atmosphere, because there's more carbon in it, can hold more water. So that, that intensity of storms is indicated or um, affected, excuse me, by that carbon in the atmosphere. Now, more carbon in the soil also equals more water in the soil. When you increase your soil organic matter, as you probably know, you also increase your water holding capacity. Now, this is a really big benefit that farmers understand and that land managers everywhere really understand, which is, okay, if I'm dealing with drought or I'm dealing with paying a lot for water or I have heavy irrigation needs, um, certainly in the Western United States, we're very dry. And, and so any amount of water that we can uh, save, conserve, or use less of is very meaningful. Now, more carbon in the soil also equals better infiltration rates. So if you're getting a ton of rain or you're in a very wet area of the country, more carbon in the soil can also help you reduce flooding. So more carbon in the soil is actually really good for water. And now remember what I said about water vapor and climate change. Well, you begin to kind of stabilize your microclimates when you begin to solve for putting carbon back into the soil and building out plants and the plant communities that interact with the water cycles. So we start to stabilize our small hydrological cycles. So it's kind of a principle just to think about on the planet, if carbon is the building block of life on the planet, that water sort of has a lag time, but it follows carbon. So where you get more carbon, you're going to get more water. Okay, it's also, of course, all about fertility. Um, and our planet is uh, the biggest producer and provider of fertility, um, life, right? So uh, when we synthesized nitrogen or Haber-Bosch synthesized nitrogen, we broke one of the major elemental cycles on the planet, which is the nitrogen cycle. Um, uh, the good news is when you increase soil carbon and you increase water in the soil, you get a change in the electromagnetic properties of the soil. The cation exchange capacity increases, which in turn helps to fix and hold more nutrients and make those nutrients more available to the plants. So as you increase carbon and water, so you also increase the fertility of that system. So you can kind of think about, or what I'm really trying to show you here is that these really major elemental cycles on the planet while they are very complex, they are related to each other. And when we begin to manage for carbon, we also begin to manage for these other really important ones like water and fertility. Another thing that's important to note here is agriculture, of course, is currently a source of emissions. Now, a lot of people think about cows. You know, cows are a source of emissions. Um, but they don't really think about synthetic fertilizers or pesticides. These inputs are very intensive from a greenhouse gas perspective. Um, so is burning a crop or um, manure, obviously. But we're kind of, um, it's kind of lost on the climate change community, these impacts of these synthetic inputs. So what's interesting also is that by and large, these synthetic fertilizers are over applied. California, for those of you who have visited or maybe heard about it, has towns in the Central Valley that no longer have clean drinking water because they have nitrate contamination in their water tables. This is from the over-application of synthetic nitrogen. Uh, UC Davis released a, a statewide nitrogen report a couple years ago that found anywhere between um, 30 to 70 percent of the nitrogen applied ended up in the water or in the air. It did not actually get to the crop. So we have this huge problem where our synthetic um, management of fertility is really causing a lot of water and air contamination problems as well as contributing to climate change. Now on the other side, we have this wonderful property of as we increase soil carbon and soil organic matter, we are also increasing the system's natural capacity for fertility, as well as helping that system be more efficient with whatever fertility is added to it. So we capture more of those nutrients and make those nutrients available to plants. All right, so back to kind of this idea of there's too much carbon in the atmosphere and not enough carbon in the soil. 
the good news is that soils are a massive sink for carbon, um, where the atmosphere has about 760 gigatons of carbon. Um, the soil sink has uh, 2,000 or more. We actually think this number is quite a bit higher in terms of the amount of carbon that's held in the soil pool or the lithosphere uh, for carbon on the planet. I should probably just let you all know carbon cycles through five major pools on the planet, the atmosphere, the biosphere or vegetation, the lithosphere or soil, fossil carbon, and then carbon within the oceans. So what this slide is really helping us understand is that via photosynthesis, we can capture a lot of that carbon from the atmosphere. And because the soil sink for carbon is so large, there's a lot of room for us to put carbon in there. There's not a lot of room in the oceans for us to put more carbon in. The oceans have been balancing out the atmosphere and absorbing huge amounts of carbon um, over the last century. And you know, scientists are beginning to start to debate, you know, what are the oceans full? At which point do the oceans become a source of carbon where they start to oxidize, where plant life and um, those little microbiological communities and kelp and plankton in the oceans start to actually die and then you have a release of carbon. Now, that's a ways away, but it is something that scientists are talking about. So for the layperson, you can kind of think about, well, the ocean is sort of full. We can't put more carbon in there. We can't keep relying on the ocean to be our sink for carbon. We really, really, really need to start emphasizing that the soil and vegetation pools are where we can put more carbon, where we can move this excess of carbon in the atmosphere into these pools. And the good news is there's a lot of room. The bad news is that um, because of modern agriculture, a lot of the carbon in our atmosphere that's excess right now was actually put there through agricultural practices like tilling and burning um, and overgrazing and the, and the erosion of soil. So we actually have agriculture right now, not only as a current contributor to climate change, but as a historical contributor to rising atmosphere atmospheric carbon. Um, so much so that right now, um, another body of literature in the scientific community is pointing to the fact that a lot of these soil systems, similar to the ocean systems, may tip at a certain point. You know, we've all heard about the permafrost melting. Well, as soils degrade, as they lose their plant life, um, as you get desertification, and as you get temperature increases, the microbiological communities in the soil start to shift. And um, what researchers are showing is that at a certain temperature point, without any action, without us taking any action, without us changing anything, that soils across the world may start to oxidize. Uh, Dr. Silver of the Marin Carbon Project did do a literature review fairly early on in the project that showed that rangelands actually are already losing carbon um, worldwide. And that's something uh, that's important to note. It's happening because of overgrazing and erosion. It's happening because of changes in species composition, moving from perennial to annual grasses. It's, it's happening because of changes in weather patterns, longer droughts, rainfall that's out of sync, so on and so forth. Um, but one of the specific things that the Marin Carbon Project found was that actually the control plots in an experiment lost carbon. And then this was then backed up by this literature review and subsequent papers that have shown that rangelands across the planet are by and large losing carbon. Now, what the Marine Carbon Project also showed was that the benefits of compost actually caused those rangelands to heal and go from a source of carbon to a sink of carbon. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more about right now is this specific example of the Marine Carbon Project. So this is a picture of the co-founders of the Marin Carbon Project, Peggy Rathman and her husband, John Wick. They're up on their ranch in Nicasio in Marin. Um, many of you on this call may have heard the story, but I'll kind of uh, tell it again. It's a good one. And for those of you who haven't, John and Peggy actually um, were not scientists. Peggy is a children's book author uh, and has produced several Caldecott award-winning children's books. I think this is important to note and understand. Part of the reason, in my opinion, that the Marin Carbon Project was so successful is that it was imagined and birthed by two people who were dedicated to creating whole new worlds together. 
John worked in support of Peggy's books by creating animated scenes, building um, you know, models, uh, building out the characters, putting different scenes together, essentially building a whole world for these books. So these two folks, when they found out about how bad climate change was in 2008, decided to stop their life and focus completely on trying to find solutions for climate change. So Peggy stopped writing books. She became concerned about a future of a world for children if there was um, the impacts of climate change. And um, together they dedicated themselves to starting to look at ways to solve it. Um, simultaneously, they had also bought a ranch at that time, this ranch. And uh, the ranch, they'd kicked the cows off and wanted it to return to nature. Uh, and what happened actually was that weeds took over um, uh, bushes took over, they lost their grazing areas, they lost their meadows, um, and the population of animals on the property actually ended up suffering. And they're also their weed population got really bad. So at this point in time, they started looking at solutions. John was a big engineer guy. He actually had bought trucks and rocks to create a dam on his property, and he was gonna move some of this water that you see in that picture over to his property and build a whole new dam. So, um, you know, in this process, what they realized was they couldn't pull out the weeds, they couldn't spray the weeds, they couldn't mow them down. It didn't matter what they did, the weeds continued to spread and their property continued to just turn into a giant weedy jungle. Um, then they met someone named Dr. Jeffrey Creek, who's a rangeland ecologist. Now, Jeff really shifted their thinking and ultimately became a co-founder of the Marin Carbon Project with them. What Jeff got them to do was to say, hey, you know, you actually have some really beautiful perennial grasses that are growing up on the top of your hills. Have you ever thought about managing for their health? Jeff was the first person that they had consulted in their long list of expensive consultants and ag consultants who said, you have something good going on on your property. Why don't we try to support and solve for what's good? Because this is also really important because unlike coming at it as the problem, which they had been doing for a long time, they suddenly shifted and started to think about, well, how do we solve for and promote what's working? How do we make it work better? And at this point in time, they began to bring grazers back on their property. They brought cows back in. Um, they created a grazing management plan. They learned all about Alan Savory and they became really interested in this idea that their grazing management um, could affect uh, climate change, could sequester more carbon in their soils. Well, what's interesting is that they went out and they did a survey with Dr. Wendy Silver, who agreed to help them, but she also let them know that she doubted that they were gonna find what they wanted to find. And she went out and she surveyed a bunch of properties. This doesn't get talked about a lot, but in the beginning, because they were looking at grazing management, they went out and surveyed 30 sites in Marin, all of which had different grazing management paradigms historically. And they found this massive difference in the soil carbon in these properties, but that difference wasn't based on the grazing management style of the property. It was very, very large differences, but again, not at all correlated with how folks had grazed their rangelands. Wendy did a literature review and found something similar across the state of California no correlation to um, long-term soil carbon and grazing management. Well, this went in the face of a lot of things that they had thought they knew, but they were curious about why some of those ranches had high soil carbon. So they went back and they interviewed all the farmers um, on the ranches that had soil, soil carbon and they asked them, you know, what have you done historically? And what, what it turned out was that all the ranches with high soil carbon had been applying manure historically. They were either part of or located next to dairies that needed to get rid of their excess manure. So they then switched their hypothesis from can my grazing management sequester carbon to can a single application of a topical organic amendment uh, sequester carbon. Instead of using manure, which has a lot of problems, the nitrogen is pretty hot, it can have weed seeds and other pathogens in it, um, they used compost as this stabilized form of nutrients and carbon. Um, they tested, uh, initially they had um, five 
uh, blocks of plots on their property and five blocks of plots up in the Sierra Nevada foothills. I believe it's five, maybe it's three. Anyway, they did these replicate control and treatment plots, both in Marin, um, where it's wetter, and up in the Sierras, where it's drier. It's sort of bracketing the system. They initially used half an inch of compost. Later in their secondary experiments, they would use a quarter inch of compost. And they applied it using a manure spreader. That's what this picture is here. Um, there was, it was Feather River Green Wakes compost. It was an organic compost. Um, and they applied it at a quarter inch. So what did they find? They found that that one-time amendment uh, increased uh, respiration and carbon sequestration in the soils. This is what I was talking about earlier. The, the bar on your left, um, excuse me, the bar on your right, which you see going into the negative, the control plot shows those plots losing carbon. The bar on the right shows that the composted plot actually increased carbon. Now, John's tendency was to put more compost out there to try it again, to see if something else happened. But Wendy really talked him out of it and said, let's just wait and see. Let's wait and see what happens over the next couple of years, What if this continues or if we go back to normal. What they found over five years, and this now, this year, we did the 10-year samples, and so that data will be published next year, is that actually carbon continued to increase in um, all forms of uh, soil carbon. These, those occluded light fraction is just different um, depths of uh, different, sorry, forms of soil carbon, and then they tested at different depths. And this rigor, I think, is really important. Um, you'll notice they tested 0 to 10, 10 to 30, 30 to 50, and 50 to 100 centimeters, both in the occluded light fraction and in the heavy fraction. The heavy fraction of carbon, that's carbon that gets stored for hundreds of years. So that's not carbon that's in your soil organic matter that's readily available to the microbiological community to eat. That's carbon that gets um, like surrounded by a harder shell or locked inside a mineral casing and isn't available to be eaten. Um, this finding that the heavy fraction of soil carbon increased was game changing for the field because previously, while we had known it was possible to build soil organic matter very rapidly, climate scientists um, knew that that carbon in soil organic matter or in those lighter upper fractions of the soil can um, just uh, cycle back out, right? Because it comes in and then it gets eaten by microbes and gets released and oxidized back into the atmosphere. This finding that the compost actually triggered carbon sequestration and storage in these heavier fractions of carbon was really game changing because we didn't think that the soil could be a long-term sink for carbon. We knew a lot of carbon was in there and that a lot could be stored there, but we thought it cycled out very rapidly. This finding really helped demonstrate that in fact, you could not only increase soil organic matter, but you could increase durable soil carbon very quickly. Um, so here's that total compost increased um, soil uh, carbon in these different uh, plots. What's an interesting here is that this happened even in the drought that started um, 2011 and 2012. Uh, so even in those drought years, we still saw those uh, plots with compost received um, growing more grass and therefore sequestering more carbon. So keep in mind that the compost did add some carbon to this, but this is photosynthetically derived carbon. Um, they took this through a model. They took that first four or five years of data and put it into the Descent model, which is run out of Colorado State University. Now, what this graph is showing you, this black hockey stick that comes down from the top, that's the carbon that comes in from the compost. So the compost actually does add carbon to the system. It doesn't all get eaten. Some of it actually stays in the soil. So the carbon from the compost itself comes into the system, begins to taper off. What happens when this system health improves because you have better water and better nutrients in the soil is you get this cascading sort of symphonic looking uh, bar of notes. And what's that showing is that it's showing the anticipated ecosystem um, net carbon. So the benefits that are coming of carbon coming in from photosynthetically derived processes. So this is not the carbon from compost, that's the black hockey stick, all these little dots, that's the carbon that's anticipated to come into the system 
photosynthetically. So that's where you start to be like, wow, that's a lot of carbon. And if we know we can bring that carbon in and it can be stored for a long time, then we start to think about it a little bit differently. So of course we know that the carbon is causing plants to grow more because the system is healthier overall. Um, and what this means for the ranching community and why this part reason why this practice has been so accepted by producers, ranchers and farmers is that there's a very real yield benefit so what this shows is that um, your above ground net primary productivity or your forage, your grasses, increased by a huge amount um, compared to your control plots. And I think that, um, so you had a huge growth of above ground plants, but none of those plants were invasive species. So what folks expected to see from prior studies that had been done with biosolids or with a synthetic fertilizer was that the application of an amendment, an organic amendment, would cause an increase in noxious weed species because those weed species love nitrogen. They love nutrients and those readily available nutrients cause a flush of growth. Now, because the nutrients in compost are different, they're complex and bound up with the carbon, we didn't see any increase in noxious weed species, nor did we see an increase of invasive species or undesirable species. This was really, really important for the plant community and also for um, overall for understanding how nutrients in compost are different than the nutrients in uh, a synthetic fertilizer or even a manure. This is a human picture of what that looks like. So um, in the last five years, we took, well, three years ago, we took what they did originally in Marin and the Sierra foothills out across the state of California to 15 sites in different bioclimactic regions and tested out compost on grazed rangelands. This is Russell Chamberlain. His family has been ranching since the Spanish land grants in the 1800s. And he's standing on right between the two plots. One is his control plot and the other is the plot that received that quarter inch of compost. So when you see those graphs about net primary productivity above ground, Really what that means is there's more grass, um, and which for a rancher, especially in a state that's very prone to drought or in an area that's very uh, low in water like Santa Barbara County where he is, is very, very important. Okay, so here's a similar thing where we're kind of seeing the um, original plot, one of the original plots, there were five of these on John's ranch and they tested out different practices. Now you can kind of see it with your eyes, the plots that had received compost are a little bit greener, right? You can kind of, there's one that they tested a key line plow plus compost, and then there's one that just tested compost itself. By the way, the plowed plots now are the worst of the plots. If you go out and walk on the ground, the dirt is hard, it's more bare, there's more weeds. They did not have good results with that key line or yeoman's plow. However, that composted plot still produces more grass that's higher and um, more rich than um, the other plots. Now, what's interesting about this, or one of my favorite things that I like to include in my PowerPoints, is that the cows knew this, right? We did all of the science, um, or they did all of the science. I was not part of the project at that point in time. They looked at all these different things, and then in the end, it turns out that the cows knew which areas had more grass and that that grass was more nutritious. They preferred it. Uh, they actually went back and they and tested nutrients and nutrient density and a couple of key nutrients, um, specifically protein, was higher in the grasses that came off of the plots that had received compost. So uh, the cows kind of were able to self-select for this. Okay, so there's the science. They did this, they did this research. Some of this research was done out right before the Marin Carbon Project. The initial science helped create the project. I wanted to share a little bit with you today about what the project was. People think, well, is it its own nonprofit? Is it its own special, like, you know, what is it? Well, it's really unique because it's actually not a formal collaborative. It's not its own nonprofits. It's a consortium of individuals, agencies, and organizations working together to support the adoption of carbon farming. It includes folks like Marin Organics, uh, the Resource Conservation District, the, the Land Trust, the Agricultural Extension, 
uh, agents and nonprofits like the Carbon Cycle Institute and Fiber Shed. So why did what they do succeed so well? Well, because uh, Dr. Silver is a very, very, very good scientist, and she made sure that all of their work went through a rigorous process of development, of peer review, and of publishing. Um, a lot of times we see in sort of the area of regenerative agriculture, although it really has shifted, I think, in part because of this quality of science that Marine Carbon Project produced, we had not seen a lot of rigorous science. Science is very expensive. Um, the Rathman Family Foundation spent about $8 million investing in this body of work that I've just gone over with you um, in the last couple of minutes. So this body of science uh, peer-reviewed and published uh, papers, I think they're up to 15 different papers now, really helped um, establish the, the work of the Marin Carbon Project's credibility, and it helped advance um, policy uptake and uh, really bring in um, larger scale actors to trust and understand what was going on in this space. They also standardized this practice uh, to kind of get a sense of, okay, what's going on? Um, we see a water holding capacity increase, we see a forage production increase, this is how much it costs. Now you'll kind of notice that's pretty expensive. Um, so you know if you're looking at a synthetic fertilizer, that might cost you $100 per acre versus this $1,000 per acre for compost. So pretty quickly they realized that their next challenge was going to be how to actually make it happen, and that includes the economics. They were very smart. Um, Peggy, uh, Peggy's father uh, founded Amgen, a biotech company, and was very good at doing research and development, and then also how you push out the findings that research development into the world. Um, so they had this, um, this idea that was also very much backed and informed by Dr. Jeffrey Creek, that they should utilize existing infrastructure wherever possible. So great, they have this new body of science, it's a really amazing finding, potentially game changing, um, but how are, they gonna, how are they gonna push it out? How do people in the world gonna know about it? Um, well, the Soil Conservation Service, uh, which later became the Natural Resources Conservation Service, was founded by Teddy Roosevelt to deal with the Dust Bowl. Um, when we had dry, uh, high plains, farming and plowing, uh, we're all familiar with the stories of the Dust Bowl. Response to the Dust Bowl was to go out and form these local conservation boards or soil and water conservation districts. Um, those are independent districts that receive money from a federal government agency, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, but who are governed by landowners in their area. Well, this is a perfect example of existing infrastructure. These soil and water conservation districts exist in almost every county across the whole country. So the Marin Carbon Project decided that these were gonna be their primary format for pushing out this information. They modified what the modern NRCS has, something called a conservation plan, where um, a technical service provider from the an NRCS or from your soil and water conservation district will come out and help you understand what practices could be done on your property to increase conservation. Now they took that conservation plan and they called it a carbon farm plan. And, and instead of just, instead of looking at all these different possibilities, they said, let's focus on carbon. Let's put carbon management at the center of conservation management, knowing that it has effects that are positive on water quality, water retention and biodiversity. Uh, so this is an example of a carbon farm plan uh, where they said, okay, looks like you can plant a windbreak here, looks like you're gonna be eligible for compost application over here. And this is important because they didn't want people just going out and spreading compost anywhere. Uh, and there are also several other practices that are known to enhance biological carbon, whether in animal, I'm sorry, whether in plant matter or in the soils. So this list of practices that informs a carbon farm plan well, the initial finding of the Marin Carbon Project was based on compost. A carbon farm plan is a comprehensive suite of practices that include everything from riparian restoration to silver pasture to cover cropping to hedgerows. These, all these different activities that are known to have a benefit for carbon on farm. Uh, working with a carbon farm plan um, required that um, they wanted to be able to say, well, how much carbon are we going to sequester? So one of the first projects that I worked on 
with MCP was the development of something called the Comet Planner. So working with Colorado State University, again, who's the primary academic partner for the USDA and RCS. Um, and I think, again, this was smart. They figured out, well, which research institution is going to connect us best with these large institutions that we want to eventually influence? CSU is a great candidate for that. They're already doing much of the um, calculations for the NRCS programming work. They also do the carbon calculations for the US EPA in the National Inventory of Carbon Sinks and Sources. So they were a great fit to house um, the Comet Planner. Now, Comet Planner is linked to the Descent model, the model that produced that hockey stick and sort of symphonic graph showing, modeling the possible future benefits from that one time of compost application. So connecting back to that larger ecosystems model, they built a simplified tool called Comet Planner. You can go to this tool online. It's free and accessible to the public. You can put in a project name, pick your state, pick your county. The tool has now been parameterized wherever there is data level data available, either at a county, but most often at a state level. So the data that's in this model is specific to your state and county. Uh, and you can choose you know, your number of acres and what practice you wanna do on those acres. Now, it's important to note that if you're not in California, you won't see compost come up as one of those practices. Um, that's because the Comet Planner only includes practices that the USDA has already approved as what they call conservation practices. These practices are a suite of practices that receive money from the Farm Bill's Environmental Quality Incentive Program or the EQIP program. So it's a little bit complicated, but don't get confused. We're in the process of creating a national standard for compost application on rangelands. You will find practices that include organic amendments or mulch or manure or compost on croplands already included in the tool. So they built new tools and those tools uh, were geared around California, but with a focus on being able to expand and eventually serve any state across the country. They were also very smart in that they chose to work with very respected producers in the community. So after testing it out on John's Ranch and in the Sierra Foothills at the, at the UCE Research Station, they went back out to their community and they chose three ranchers to be their kind of first demonstration projects. Um, one of them was a very conservative rancher, a uh, longtime family in the valley uh, owns a dairy. Um, another one, uh, Lauren Ponchas, has a beef company, um, was very interested in trying new things. Uh, and then there was um, Albert Strauss. If any of you have the chance to try his ice cream, I would highly recommend it. It's my favorite. <laughs> um, so Albert and these three other ranchers were very prominent um, figures within the community. So for them to go ahead and try this and test it really helped other ranchers and farmers see it. The number one information source that ranchers trust and farmers trust are other ranchers and farmers. So they, again, they were very smart in that they, they worked with these leading ranchers to try all these things out in the community, both to see if it worked on their different properties where they had different grazing management strategies, but also from the social side to begin to socialize and advertise the practice within um, a section of the community that would be very respected by other ranchers and farmers. Um, at this point in time, we also started to create more uh, social media and also just understand how we needed to talk to each other as a community. Uh, I co-wrote the soil story with Lewis Fox on the behalf of Kiss the Ground. And this story, some of you may have seen it. If you haven't, I encourage you to check it out. It's a four minute video that explains the carbon cycle and healthy soils. Um, this video didn't go viral. It's not material that would go viral and we didn't build it to go viral. I think what was really important that we worked on in this process of telling the soil story was understanding how we can speak to each other. So an academic scientist is not going to agree with everything that I've said on this call, right? But I do know that all of the language in the soil story and the language in the beginning of my presentation has all been vetted by those scientists in that community. And they said, yeah, you can say that. You know, like, you can say water follows carbon. You can talk about these different things. So this process of writing the story, yes, it was for the public, but it really was for us as a movement to learn how to talk to each other. We had some very 
um, enthusiastic advocates of soil health and the Savory Institute folks who would talk about it in this way that was almost evangelical, you know, and it would get dismissed by policymakers. And you had scientists trying to talk to policymakers who couldn't understand what they were saying. Like they didn't understand, like, what are you saying? Like the language didn't make any sense. So we created this story um, for the community to share the story and the power of soil. But the way in which we did it, we really did it in order to be able to talk to each other. How do we talk to each other without, as Paul Hawkins says, circling the wagons and shooting inward? What is safe language for us to use? What's language that we all understand? What's language that's hopeful, that's meaningful, and that can be expanded upon? So we created these common stories and we started to share them. We started to place them in different places. We started to invite in different people to write different bits. We started to speak in different areas. John Wick spoke over 500 times doing Soil Carbon 101. So we began to really talk about it. We talked a lot about it. We talked about it everywhere we could. We went to every Lions Club meeting, every public hearing, you know, all the places where you can talk about something. John Wick or Wendy Silver or Jeffrey Creek or Rebecca Burgess or myself, somebody was there talking about this work. So we spent a long time talking about it in the communities where we lived. And then I moved to Southern California and spent a lot of time talking about it with folks down there. All of this, this really good body of science, um, these producers who were leading in the community, these common stories that helped us create shared understanding of what we were all talking about, um, and a lobbying team uh, that John Wick hired after he left the Rathman Family Foundation helped us to support the passage of several new pieces of legislation in the state of California. Um, within these, you can see a lot of them are focused on uh, solid waste and or organics. Um, we knew that we needed to advance carbon farm planning and support that with a program like Healthy Soils, which matches NRCS funding with state grant funding for practices. Um, farmers can get cost share on certain practices that the state agrees have known soil carbon benefits, including compost application. Um, a lot of these other uh, leg pieces of legislation that we passed, including I think most notably SB 1383, the short-lived climate pollutants bill, um, work to move organics out of landfill, where we're building off of a legislation that had been passed before by the zero waste movement in California. And we really utilized that movement, the, the cities uh, who had been involved in this, um, academics who'd been involved in it, uh, and people, folks on the ground who were committed to this. Short-lived climate pollutants essentially brought agriculture under California's cap and trade system and began to regulate things like methane, um, nitrous oxide, and black carbon, which were previously not regulated underneath California's cap and trade program. So that means that landfills, dairies, and the agricultural sector were not under California's cap. Uh, SB 1383 brought them in to being regulated and also created a number of funding programs that helped us support the creation of a, a fund for grant, grants for compost facilities, grants for alternative manure management programs, things like that. We also had to change a bunch of rules. California is an incredibly dense government that doesn't talk to each other necessarily. We had to pass a piece of legislation forcing the different agencies that govern compost to talk to each other uh, because the water board had one set of definitions and policies and regulations and CalRecycle had another set of definitions, policies, metrics, regulations, size requirements. The air board had another set. CDFA, the Department of Food and Ag, had another set, and, and kind of in a de facto way, they were making it incredibly challenging to bring new composting on in California uh, because of all these myriad of regulations that didn't match up, didn't line up, and prevented it um, and presented a huge amount of cost for anyone who was trying to create compost. So we worked with regional air districts, cities and counties, and the state to um, begin to try to streamline these rules so that we could actually create a cohesive governance structure for compost in California, something that had not existed before. Um, kind of California's operate compost operated in either like you're a municipal compost and you're regulated by the fact that you're not going to landfill and you're in a large facility, or we don't really know how to treat you. Community composting was by and large considered illegal. 
um, on-farm composting was sort of done but not necessarily sanctioned. So we spent a lot of years detangling and trying to align these different policies. Those, much of that work is still in process, but a lot of those rules did get changed to help begin to create a more open and more fair marketplace or set of rules which would govern a marketplace that the production of compost could thrive in. We um, fostered corporate partnerships <clears throat> through Fibershed, through Kiss the Ground. Um, uh, let's see, I worked with Kiss the Ground to get Annie's. Annie's got very interested in this. They said, let's pilot this. We'll start with some dairies. Um, and uh, Organic Valley was their dairy partner, um, now offers carbon farm planning uh, to any dairy uh, in the country that's part of their collaborative that wants to do it. Uh, General Mills. Um, this year invested just over half a million dollars to train um, farmers in soil health practices through the Soil Health Academy. Um, Fibershed is in gaining increasing recognition from the fashion community uh, through its work with the North Face and others on, on renewable, sustainable, compostable, climate beneficial fibers. So we got the corporate sector to really recognize the power of this work and, and investing in their own supply chains. Um, that first Healthy Soils program had $5 million in it. The second year it had $8 million. This year, Governor Newsom uh, tripled that amount to $28 million. Um, during his uh, run for office, we hosted fundraisers for him in every major city throughout the state. And at those fundraisers, we always talked about soil health or we showed some cool video about soil health. We brought in someone from the corporate sector in the natural food sector to talk about healthy soils. Uh, and by the time he got to office, he's like, I think healthy soils are really cool. So we did a lot of groundwork to educate our new governor and that's really literally paid off for us in the size of the amount of funding that California has uh, allocated this year to the healthy soils program. We also scaled technical assistance. So those conservation districts, well now over 60 of them offer carbon farm planning throughout the state. This was mostly done in conjunction with the Carbon Cycle Institute and the California Association of Resource Conservation Districts, um, which now offers that training to any RCD that wants to come in and have it done. So ideally now, if you're a farmer in most places in California, you can walk into your resource conservation district ask for a carbon farm plan and someone can come out and help you create it. So that original model that was created by the Marin Carbon Project is now available at resource conservation districts throughout the state. Um, this work catalyzed a movement. You can check out this website. Uh, we recently created this map with Soil for Climate and Nerds for Earth. Um, it shows the states where new legislation has passed. Legislation is pending drafted or states that don't call it soil health or climate policy, but have policies like water quality or cover crop policies that do relate to soil health, um, all detailed out. So if you're a policy wonk or you wanna find out more about what's going on in your state at the legislative level, this is a great tool to kind of help you do that. Um, we now have, we've seen a bunch of these states follow. I'm now doing a lot of work in Colorado. I helped New Mexico get their legislation passed. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work supporting legislative efforts at the state level across the country because we are gearing up for the next farm bill, right? We want this work to end the constituents on the ground who are engaged in it to really be prepared to ask for significant reform within the next farm bill um, because that piece of legislation manages a huge amount of money and um, technical service provision that's essential for driving these practices from demonstration into business as usual. So I'm gonna just go back and talk a little bit about compost since this is what the bub series is based around. In this whole process, compost has remained the most sought after um, practice of any of the practices in the Healthy Soils Program. It's more popular uh, by half than any other practice that the state of California subsidizes. Um, and it's the first thing that a farmer or rancher wants on their property. Well, why is that? Because it has, like I said, a yield benefit, because it has benefits um, for fertility and for water holding capacity. Many of these other practices, while they are incredibly important for the ecosystem and health and biodiversity, take time. Riparian restoration, you might not see benefits on that, your property from that for several years. 
Um, cover crops take a couple years to get right. Um, compost, you see those benefits immediately and it's very meaningful. So in that way, compost kind of acts as this gateway drug. It's the kind of the first thing that people get interested in, but then as they learn about it and they understand it, they also learn about soil health and the whole ecology around it, and then they get interested, and then they get interested in doing those other practices as well. So um, I like to think about compost sometimes as a gateway drug, but mostly just as a joke. I like to think about it in a way that Donella Meadows, the very famous systems thinker, thought about it, which is it's a leverage point. So in a complex system like our food system that we're looking to change, there are going to be certain leverage points, little keys or acupuncture points that will help us open up and shift the rest of the system. Because compost has benefits both upstream from a climate perspective downstream from a carbon sequestration perspective and around it from a reduction in synthetic fertilizer use and reduction in water use, all of which have climate implications, it's sort of a gateway or a leverage point into the larger system. Now compost is also an important um, common ground area for us in California. As you noticed, um, there were those series of different pieces of legislation that were aimed at composting um, that occurred at the same time as the Healthy Soils Program. A lot of folks talk about the Healthy Soils Program and they don't really talk about 1383 or some of these other policies that were compost-based. These compost policies or the organic material policies that banned organics from landfill and started to address organic management on farms, very, very, very important because when in doing so, we got the political support of cities which actually ended up being very important for us in getting that Healthy Soils Program passed where the city's saying, yeah, we're interested in this. We were also able to get the support of um, traditional and more conservative agricultural interests. Um, so Farm Bureau, while they didn't support healthy soils, they did not oppose. Farm Bureau, while they didn't support 1383, took a neutral position. And this allowed moderate legislators to also either vote for or be neutral on these and we didn't so we didn't garner opposition from our traditional sectors dairy actually in a lot of ways came to the table because they saw this they knew regulation was coming and they saw this as an opportunity to get some funding for things like digesters and composting to make a product that for them currently is a cost to their producers into something that had a value add, right? So if you can get a value add for compost, if the state is gonna give away money to farmers to buy compost and you're producing compost, that shifts the conversation because then you get to talk about market development. You're not just talking about climate change, you're talking about market development for a real product that has costs to real farmers and if you can shift those costs to a benefit, you have created a whole new, not only economic sector, but also the support of a political sector that may not traditionally support environmental work. So compost was a very important leverage point, both from an ecological perspective, um, from a producer perspective, and from a political perspective. Uh, so we very intentionally, scan. this was predominantly my work, personally um, and with Jenna King, who supported that work and the People, Food and Land Foundation, uh, helped to support the scaling of compost alongside the scaling of carbon farming. So if a new conservation district was gonna be getting carbon farming, they also we also would help them locate, well, what's a good source of compost within your community? Do you need to build new compost sources in your community? Does the county need to help with that? Is there a business that can help with that? Maybe can we get some grants so that ranchers can produce compost on site? So we did all of that. There's a lot of work there. I also started to work with a very few set of community composters in California who kind of existed on the margins doing bike level compost or collecting from churches or schools and doing worm composting or um, these different practices and started to really look at how to support their development. Um, simultaneously, we started to look at, well, how do we create some new products, some new innovations, some new price points in the compost space so that uh, a rancher might have access to a cheaper um, form of compost. Maybe it has chunkier bits in it than maybe someone who is, you know, growing cannabis where they're going to want a very nutrient rich, um, more like soil quality compost. So we looked at market diversification and product diversification. 
We also worked with cities, and this was really important, like I said, not only politically, but um, I think as was very well articulated by this recent report last year from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, cities are really a leverage point within the food system when it comes to returning nutrients. So we have cities as these huge consumers of nutrients, but then those nutrients, they all just go in there and they either end up in our wastewater system or they end up in the trash, in the landfill. Um, and if we're looking at trying to restore some carbon and nutrient balance within our agricultural system, we have to go after all those nutrients that are going into cities and figure out ways to get them back out again. So that linear food model really becomes circular at the point of the city. So the city is an incredible leverage point in that food system for reintroducing organic sources of fertility and preventing a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that would result from the landfilling, the burning of those materials and the use of synthetic fertility. So in, in framing this up, what one of the things that, we, that I did was to work with um, a mapper, David Kruzma, to produce a heat map of composting sources. Uh, we generally look at waste, although I know folks on the call probably don't, but you know, people look at waste as a burden, as a cost. We wanted to reframe it and look at it as a resource. So if we're gonna need a lot of compost, um, at the beginning of the call, I think uh, 3 billion tons was mentioned. If we half that, it's 1.5 billion tons of compost needed. Where's it gonna come from? So we started to map this out. And we started to say, okay, yeah, it's gonna come from municipal composting. It's also gonna come from folks composting on farm. And it's also gonna come from compost composters that exist in cities, people who are making soil and keeping those soils in cities for urban gardens, for the health of trees, for the health of parks. So we started to really define all these different areas and support the development of compost, both legally and um, economically within these different sectors. Uh, this is a, a rough estimate or a best, I guess you could say a best estimate that we could get of potential feedstocks for compost in the state of California. This does not include the dead and dying trees, which is a potentially massive source of biomass. Um, and it does not include orchards, but it does include vineyards and general wood waste, materials from chip and grind, biosolids, and other organic materials. So you can see that if we're getting this much potentially organic material, if we're able to capture a very large percentage of that and turn it into compost, every year we can have more compost that goes out on the landscape. This is what that looks like on a heat map with the composting facilities we have superimposed over it. This really helped us point out that, boy, in the Central Valley where you have those big concentrations of organic material from the dairies and down in Southern California, you don't really have enough processing capacities. This is something else we spent a lot of time working on was developing out funding sources and then legal frameworks for an increase in processing, processing capacity. So we have a lot more material, that material is not gonna go to the landfill or it's gonna have to come out of those slurry ponds. Where's it gonna go? We're gonna have to build more processing capacity. So I'm getting to the end here, but there's a couple quick things I wanted to talk to you about, which are some lessons learned. You know, a lot of you at the beginning of this um, uh, webinar talked about, well, I'm here because I wanna learn how to communicate the climate benefits of compost. So what I would say to that is, compost is like a triple win. It's a win, win, win for climate. You avoid um, potent greenhouse gases, short-lived greenhouse gases upstream like methane and black carbon by capturing those materials and composting them. So you're avoiding those emissions you're mitigating those emissions, then you are getting to um, sequester those emissions when you apply the compost to soil. But you also get all these tertiary benefits, which is what if these are replacing synthetic fertilizer? What if the soil is already so damaged that it's losing carbon and the use of compost is helping slow or heal or stop that loss? So it's a win-win-win. Also, from a resilience perspective, as you know, when you have more water in the soil and more vegetation, the temperature is more stabilized. So you're less likely to see those big temperature swings that cause crop failure, that cause heat waves, when you have systems more where more water is sticking around in the soil. So soil that has a good amount of soil organic matter and water in it is gonna be more resilient to both extreme flooding and extreme heat. So it's actually from an ecological standpoint, one of the best practices that we can do for our landscapes to be able to withstand these extreme weather patterns that are coming up because of climate change. 
So those are your climate things. Compost is a triple win. Now, one of the things that we learned that's really, really important here is that nobody really knows what compost is. Maybe you are aware of that. I was very shocked when I learned that people thought dried manure was compost, they thought rotting food was compost. So really defining what compost is and then defining very specifically that the nutrients in compost are different than the nutrients in the synthetic fertilizer or manure. If you're anywhere that has a water quality issue, this is gonna be very, very, very important because when you are adding a source of fertility, you are generally putting that water quality at risk if you're gonna be over adding it. But what composting does is it stabilizes those nutrients by binding them up with the carbon and then allowing them to be slowly released over time by the microbiological community when the plants need them. So in fact, unlike other sources of fertility which can cause problems, um, composting is a best practice for nutrient management. And that's a really important finding. Um, it took me about a year to figure out that the state of California's water board at this point, maybe four, three or four years ago, didn't understand the difference between synthetic and organic nitrogen. Now, you would think that a regulatory body that is involved with water quality might need to understand that, but there was in fact only one member on the board who understood it and the other members didn't understand it. So they didn't know how to ask questions about it. And they were regulating compost like it was a synthetic fertilizer. Right, so that's a huge problem if you're trying to advance compost production and all of a sudden its production is getting regulated like you're producing a synthetic fertilizer or you're applying a synthetic fertilizer. So if you're gonna be out there talking about compost, it's really, really important that you talk about the nutrients in compost being different, being more stable, not creating water quality problems. In fact, the EPA lists compost as a best practice for riparian restoration because it helps stabilize the soil and prevent erosion and decrease nutrient leakage. So these are just some things to keep in mind for any of you who might be talking about this to folks in your communities. So the last thing I'm gonna close up with is that compost isn't just a leverage point, compost is synergistic. We all know about synergy, right? Where one plus one doesn't equal two, but one plus one equals three or five, that there are these things that come together and become more than the sum of their parts. We also know about entropy. I think what you can see right happen, happening right now with climate change is an entropic collapse of the planetary weather systems that are dependent upon this balance of the elements on the planet. So we are in an entro in like entropic collapse, right? But what's wonderful is that when we get the synergy right, you can switch that around to a synergistic function of health and healing and well-being that just that this these cycles have to be managed so this this framework of linear or points of change really really has got to change in your own mind first to understand what a synergistic function is and that nature is a system of synergistic and entropic functions compost is a synergy what do i mean by that well when you burn residues in fields you get black carbon air pollution when you put all <laughs> of your manure in these um, feedlots and you have floods or even if it's just sitting there you have a water quality problem but when you bring these two things together when you bring this woody biomass that if it gets burned is causing air problems and health problems together with a manure product or a human waste product that is maybe causing other contamination problems or increasing the risk of water contamination you bring them together you not they don't just cancel each other out they actually make something that's even better right so this is the thing I wanna impress upon you. Compost is a synergy. It's solving multiple problems to create a solution that has multiple benefits throughout the system. And that's all I'm gonna to talk to you about. Thanks so much. Oh, wow, Calavos, that was amazing. And I just love how you started out with Peggy and John, you know, Peggy being a children's you know, book author. And, to, and her husband together imagining, just having, you know, imagine and creating a whole new world together and look what, look what they've done as a result, their research, you know, feeding into, um, the, you know, the research, the science, then the lobbying team, then passing the California legislation, funding the Comet Planner, online tools that other people can use and the cascading effects, which I think you so adequately, um, 
you know, a, you, just in the science itself, cascading effects in so many ways with the, you know, compost has carbon and some, you know, some many, much of that stays in the soil, but the, you, because you're improving the health of the whole system, you have this cascading quote, bar of notes that you get from the carbon derived from photosynthesis. So I learned a whole lot. I'm sure most of the people on the call did. Um, I'm going to um, ask my team, we're gonna skip the polling questions. We had a couple, but we're gonna skip those just so we can get to more questions. And I know we only have six minutes planned for this, but I wanna ask you, Calla Rose, if you can, if, if you can stay on for a few additional minutes since it's recorded just to get some more answers, even if uh, attendees have to sign off. Yes, or, of course. If, Sorry, I talked okay. a little bit over, but no, I'm I was, as long as you need. It was amazing. I think we all, um, you covered so much and in a way that um, we can understand. So um, amazing. So, okay, let's get right to it. So the, um, there's a number of questions and I'm just gonna basically mostly go in order in which they came in because I think that makes sense. So one was, what was the feedstock for the compost, you know, for the trials? Was it just landscape material or was it food-based, you know, food scrap compost? Yeah, so um, that feather, the initial uh, marine carbon project trials was just a green waste-based compost. However, the demonstration projects with the producers in their community and the field trials across the state that we did with the state NRCS um, used a, um, a manure and green waste compost. Okay, good. And more than I just want to also press mm -hmm. on the fact that it's less of a question of what are the feedstocks because the thermophilic process breaks everything down to something that looks pretty similar to everything else. Um, the thing that you really need to pay attention to um, is the nitrogen, carbon nitrogen ratio, right? So for rangelands, you would want a higher carbon ratio. And for a row crop that was more nutrient intensive, you would want a higher nitrogen compost. So people often ask about feedstocks, but what I'd encourage you to do is actually really think about the CN ratio that's going to be appropriate for that landscape or crop. Okay. And does the, does your work or this the Marin Project uh, look at um, biosolids produced compost for grasslands? That was a question that came in. Is it okay to use city produced biosolids compost? Yeah. So there's a whole other branch of this work that I didn't talk about. It was called Thermopile, right? Because Peggy and John are trying to envision this whole world, and they've got these experts like Wendy Silver and Jeff and Nancy Scolari who are helping them do it, and then and then myself from a policy perspective. And of course, a huge percentage of organic material is, is in biosolids. Um, so they did a, a whole research project um, looking at composting human waste directly um, and with on different forms of on-farm composting, so small scale. And then the, the outgrowth of that is a body of work by a woman, a young woman named um, Gabrielle Black. She's at Davis getting her postdoc and um, she's studying the effects of composting on um, hormones and compounds of emerging concern because the things that you have to be the most careful about are what are the chemical cocktails that are in biosolids that come from all the different pharmaceuticals and laundry detergents and our clothing that are getting all mixed up in the wastewater system and essentially creating endocrine disruption. And so, you know, I think it's important to note that biosolids right now are applied to soils and our water treatment process for um, human waste was developed before we had all of these pharmaceuticals and chemicals in our water stream. So that water process is not designed to deal with any of it. Um, Gabby has looked at some interesting things which show the degradation of certain of these compounds from the composting process. And then there's also been some other good research done on it. once these things are applied to a healthy soil community, the further breakdown. Um, so it's definitely, you have to be aware of that. And again, you have to be really aware of if there's any heavy metals, like in systems that might have have an industrial input, there could be heavy metals and that's really, you have to watch out for that. But otherwise, a biosolid based compost would be fine on rangelands. Um, you would just wanna make sure again that you had a higher carbon compost than a higher nitrogen compost. And again, I say fine because 
all that stuff is going out on the landscape anyway. It's better if you compost it and it's better if you add the compost to the soil community because it'll come up and become alive and becoming more awake and alive, it'll continue to eat through a lot of those things. So the best case scenario is a composted biosolid product um, that gets onto a soil community that's invigorated and healthy that can further dispose of those things. Yeah, good. And what we'll try to do um, is, uh, well, we can add some of these resources that Calavos has mentioned, including the the short video, the soil story, um, on the post when we uh, post the recording for this webinar. So maybe if there's a link to Gabby's research, we can we can include that. Sure. Um, so. Um, uh, quick, qu one quick question: Does the carbon to come in photo with photosynthesis? Does that come from the plants? Yes. So, I, yeah, I thought that was a quick. That's plant-derived carbon. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, another participant said, "I think I heard you say that the atmosphere gets saturated with carbon and cannot hold any more. What happens with the extra carbon then?" Oh, so that's the ocean. Um, and um, it's complex, right? The ocean, uh, the carbon cycle in the ocean, it generally comes in and you create carbonic acid. So a lot of times people hear about ocean acidification, but they don't realize that that's connected to climate change, right? That's because the ocean is absorbing so much of this atmospheric carbon. So combining acidification with increasing temperatures in the ocean what scientists are concerned about is that at some point the oceans may switch from being a net sink of carbon to a net source of carbon. And in fact, the rate of carbon sequestration in the ocean is beginning to show some slowdown. Um, so that's what I mean by like, it's an overly simplified, but you can think about the fact that we can't put any more carbon in the ocean. We have to start actively putting it in the soil. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you. There's a question, just in terms of understanding the data and the science presented. So the data showing with the compost applications, increasing soil carbon over time makes sense because a physical material that is added to amend the soil is made of carbon and therefore adds carbon. Here's the question. How can we be sure that the increase in carbon over the course of years is not just measuring the addition via via the amendment, but rather is the result of carbon dioxide being drawn out of the atmosphere. Right, so, so th that's why I showed that slide um, from CSU that shows the input of carbon from the compost itself versus the photosynthetically derived carbon in the system. Now, what Wendy and her team did was they actually went through and they separated out the carbon from the compost and then they tested those deep fractions of carbon so that's why you had the 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 50, or no, 30 to 50, 50 to 100 centimeters. So they physically separated out the carbon from the compost for as long as they could see it. Um, and then they were also testing carbon at other depths and in other fractions. So there's different fractions of carbon and there's different, and the carbon gets stored at different depths. Carbon fractionation is very, very expensive. Part of the reason why this research was so compelling was because they did fractionation on all of their um, on all of their tests, and that's what helps you differentiate between those types of carbon. The other way that we knew it was photosynthetically derived carbon was there's a particular carbon isotope, and I don't want to say it wrong. I thought it was C14, but there's a particular carbon isotope that was released into the atmosphere when the French tested their last nuclear bomb. Um, and so we can trace those um, uh, carbon isotopes down into, you know, uh, people do this all the time with carbon dating, right? But those carbon isotopes were what Wendy found uh, when she did the fractionation and, and at depth. So that body of research has not been published yet. Um, I hope that the grad student who is graduated eventually decides to publish that data, but the way we were able to confirm, in addition to the like sorting out of the compost carbon by hand and then testing at different depths, was the um, presence of that carbon isotope in fresh pools of carbon where you didn't see it um, in the other plots. So again, that's not a, it's not a published body of work, um, but that was one of the things that they looked at. And if you want to know more about that, I would connect you with Dr. Silver, 
who can answer it far better than I can. I think that was plenty well, well done. Okay, so how, another question, how is the test projects with the three ranchers funded and did the leading ranchers pay in to participate in the test projects or were all of the costs covered by another source? Yeah, the initial demonstration projects were all covered by Rathman Family Foundation and then John and Peggy personally. So it should really not be lost on the fact that this worked because the co-founders had um, a significant pool of wealth to draw from. Uh, at this point in time, ranchers can apply for um, uh, State of California funding um, to get that compost on site. And there's also a lot of different ways in which we're trying to make it economically feasible, like producing compost on site um, or having uh, cities um, donate or offer a subsidized rate for people who are participating in carbon farming because of the carbon benefits associated with it. But those initial three demonstration ranches uh, were funded completely um, through philanthropic funding. Great. So there's a, I have like, I think I have like four or five questions that maybe we can do as a lightning round where you just say yes, no. But <laughs> I do want to say, Calla Rose, if you want to expand on the answer, feel free. I don't want to, you know, constrain you. Okay, so here's one. Is the cow meat from compost plots better? That is the good fats, like the Montana State University study on grass-fed beef having more good fats. Yes or no? We didn't test that. Okay. Good. Have you extended the projects to regenerated damaged soils from the mining industry? It seems that there are copper mines in Marin County. Yes or no? <laughs> oh, I'm not aware of any copper mines. I know of some folks in Colorado who have successfully used biosolids compost for mine remediation, but no. Okay. Would you allow others to use your images with proper credit with proper credit for a composting class? In particular, the image of the rancher with the different plots of grass and the cow photo. Yes, I'll just need to give you the citation. Okay. Uh, okay, so is there, I, I like doing this lightning round, but um, is there a state by state inventory of the status of this work, example, in North Carolina is either North Carolina State University or North Carolina A&T working with extension services to get farmers, ranchers knowledgeable about this. Are they teaching this at the academic level? I know that's more than one question, but. So that map, that state soil health policy map, which is up on Nerds for Earth, that's mm -hmm. the, um, there, and there's a couple the Soil Health Institute has a list of policies, the map is, more helpful, I think, because it breaks them out. Um, the Isaac Walton League has a great report out that goes through states and their policies. Um, what we tried to do on the soil health policy map was also put in resources like the ag extension. If there was a branch of ag extension that was working on soil health uh, or compost work, um, we specifically listed in them in there. Or if there was a university that we know about that was working on it specifically listed. That being said, that is a crowdsourced map. So if you get on there and you see information that you know about that isn't on there that you think should be on there, um, email the state page curator and they will get that information up because it's hard to know everything, but we know people on the ground know what's going on where they are. Okay. Um, another one that's very a good follow-up that maybe a yes, no as well. Is there a toolkit how to approach state government farmers, others that could be applied in other states? Again, we're trying to use that policy map as the way to push out toolkits. There are several advocates across the country who are participating in that, including Kiss the Ground's advocate training program, um, Stephen Kilty with Soil for Climate who offers um, like organizing uh, strategy and um, uh, like basic toolkit stuff, but we're trying to use the map again as the place to push that information out. So if you're looking for that, again, I would urge you to email the uh, state page curator whose email is listed in your state um, and ask for that. Yeah, okay. I don't think the next questions follow into the lightning round, so, um, but, um, uh, one listener would like to hear or see the triple win points again. I don't think you need to show the slide, but if you could just reiterate the triple. Yeah, unfortunately, I didn't write it on the slide. I should have. It's a it's a triple win from a climate perspective because you have upstream mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions, right? You're avoiding methane or you're not burning it, so you're you're not producing that black carbon. So you have mitigation, 
Then you have sequestration, which is when you apply it to soil, if it's used in conjunction with a cover crop or if it's on a rangeland and it's done appropriately, you're increasing sequestration, right? So mitigation, sequestration, and then you're displacing other emissions, right? So if you're in a cropping system and then the farmer uses less of a synthetic fertilizer, that means that you're displacing those emissions that would have happened with the application of so much of that fertilizer. If you're placing it on a rangeland that may be losing carbon, you're stopping that loss of carbon and you're failing the system. So those are the three climate pieces. The fourth one is resilience. So you're making your landscape more resilient to extreme weather. Oh, good. Um, did you did the project or any of this work get pushback or attempts to undermine the efforts and published findings from Big Cam Fertilizer World? Do they no? Just, so no? they were very smart, and I recognized this early on. They stayed in rangelands for the first eight years. So they stayed in a system that had no, where they were presenting no competition to any traditional vested interests, like in seed or chem, because there are no interests in it because it's, it's a totally marginal business. So no one's ever invested $8 million in rangeland research in the US before. Just, you, why would you do it? There's no business there. So they were very smart. They started in rangelands because it was where they were and what they were looking at, but they stayed in rangelands for so long and specifically stayed away from, in fact, a lot of the language I used today I wouldn't have used last year because we are very, very, very careful in avoiding um, talking about replacement of synthetic fertilizer up until now where we feel like there's enough evidence and momentum where we can really start talking about that. Yeah, good. Has the possibility of earning carbon credits been studied as an incentive and has support for these, and as support for these carbon sequestration efforts? This person is thinking in terms of a carbon exchange program and the possibility of earning car carbon credits. Yeah, so this whole thing was actually spurred when California adopted a cap and trade program in 2008 and they thought they could get carbon credits for rangelands for grazing. So. Um, I did mention this briefly, but there is a protocol for compost application on grazed rangelands that the American Carbon Registry has up. Um, so if you're in a voluntary market, you can use that protocol and produce that credit. Uh, it hasn't been cost effective to produce those credits to date. There, That might be changing because there's this big influx of money from um, corporate actors who have carbon neutrality goals. And in order to get to neutrality, they're going to need to purchase offsets. Um, so, you know, we might see some uptake in that. Uh, Nori, which is a recent platform that launched publicly last week, uh, uses Comet Planner to help reduce its transaction costs and has a soil carbon credit program. Again, that's a voluntary credit program. Um, and the ecosystem service marketplace uh, is also going to get up and running here in the next, I don't know, fairly soon, and they will have a a credit program that again is funded by corporate buyers. So I hope that we'll see some corporate money flow down to farmers, but to date, um, it, there hasn't been economically efficient. Uh, a credit has been an inefficient form of delivering funding. All right, stay tuned for that. Um, you mentioned that John Wick was interested in continuing to use compost over multiple years. Do you know of any research that has looked into whether there is a saturation point of diminishing return to adding compost? Yeah. That's a great question. It's something that the scientific community is really hot on right now. They're trying to figure out what, you know, what's the saturation rate for um, soil carbon or soil organic matter in particular. Um, right now, California ag lands are about around 1.5 1, 1. or sometimes less than 1% soil organic matter. Um, what we do know is there's examples of agricultural lands in California having up to 12% soil organic matter. So while it does pose a very interesting scientific question, like at what point do you saturate? And you will saturate at some point. Um, the, the space between 0.5% you know, and 12% is huge in, in terms of tons of carbon. Um, so from a, from a climate change perspective, um, it does have implications, but um, not not immediately and not in any way that would prevent us from not running after it as fast as we could. Okay, as a, as a follow-up, um, this person wanted to know, to what degree do you think Marin Carbon Project results be 
speak to bolstering of an already at risk soil compared to healthy soil? I don't really understand the question. Um, do you, I mean, do you think the findings from the Marin Carbon Project uh, will will help at risk soil? I don't know actually, bolstering. Oh, so, so I guess here's yeah. what I'll say. Yeah. Um, yeah, those were degraded rangelands, right? <clears throat> so yeah. in the protocol, actually in the ACR protocol, it specifies that you want to be in a degraded system. Um, we've had some range systems uh, in parts of Colorado and Montana that are fairly intact native prairie with perennial grasses and were never plowed. We're not talking about putting compost there. This is uh, a practice for um, rangelands that may have been plowed previously, have been heavily grazed, um, and are considered um, degraded. And also there's a couple of parameters around like serpentine soils, you don't want to put compost on, um, you know, a soil where that is already very rich in organic matter, you're going to see less of a benefit. We saw this in like in the field trials in the state in like Humboldt County where they get a lot of rain and they had already some pretty healthy soils. Um, their benefit was a lot less than the benefit we saw down in San Diego or Santa Barbara. Now they still saw a benefit, but um, the the magnitude of that benefit was less. So this is really a practice for targeting degraded soils first um, and then uh, moving up from there. Yeah, okay, so uh, just a couple, um, a few more questions, a few more minutes, a couple more minutes on this. So how can we get organizations like Soil Health Partnership to acknowledge compost use as a soil health practice? I don't know if you're familiar with them. There's so many different names that all sound very similar, so I don't know. Um, or let's just say organizations that are working <laughs> in soil health, how do we get them to recognize compost as a well, soil health practice? Just you know, we're hoping that the USDA starts to recognize it as a soil health practice. That'll be a big win. I mean, the other thing is it's really good to do trials in your community. Um, we've certainly seen some of the local resource conservation districts do trials in urban gardens or on small range sites um, on, uh, you know, so different like sod companies have done demonstrations for lawns. Um, you know, doing a demonstration project in your community or in the jurisdiction of that organization and doing it in conjunction with either your agricultural extension or your conservation district or university so that you're getting actually some really some real science on it. You know, you're setting up a control and a treatment plot. Um, you have multiple plots, so it's replicated, you know, those types of things. But it's not easy. Um, it, people don't uh, people don't take it for granted. Um, they just they don't really believe it, and it's come to something that has to be seen. So I would suggest trying to do a trial in in that area. Yeah, and there, a kind of maybe perhaps a somewhat related question is uh, somebody asked, how do we integrate the management of private lands into the management of public lands, noting that forest management has historically been a challenge. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I think that the economics differ depending on if it's a public or private land management. And um, so you really have to work with those land managers. I mean, the single biggest indicator of market access or the uptake of a practice within agriculture, whether that is forestry or um, row crops or rangelands, is technical assistance. Um, so you have to invest in educating those land managers and having them um, take part in the process because them knowing about something is going to be how that thing takes place. So the economics are different for public and private a little bit. And you also really have to get those um, technical assistance providers, whether they're private or public, educated. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to say about experience with biochar? People are always I don't have much experience with, I have no experience with biochar. Okay. I, have been so the thing that is that's been a differentiating factor for me why I have not worked on biochar is that compost is not um, it's very hard to finance compost right because municipal regulations generally control your feedstock or a farmer is just producing their own compost there's no large scale economic interest by which to finance R and D and or deployment or adoption of it I don't know if that makes sense biochar because it's a machine that has to be sold and that makes it, it has built in economic interest for 
R&D and promotion and adoption. So I have not worried about biochar getting sorted out. Some of it's, it's all different, right? Like biochar can be a million different things. So some of it is helpful for water and soil infiltration and some of it's helpful when it's coupled with compost. You know, there's a lot of good things about biochar. There's a lot of uh, hot air about biochar, but I have not focused on it because there's an economic engine in place for its deployment. Compost's economic engine is the people. It's people in cities, it's people on farms, it's people in communities. Um, because it benefits the people, it doesn't have any specific, it's just harder for an economic interest to make a lot of money off of it. So social adoption is much uh, slower. Uh, that is a very interesting point. Okay, so there, I, I know we have to uh, draw this webinar to a, a close, and I'm sorry to listeners who didn't get your questions answered. I will just say that based on the still such high attendance, even 20 minutes after we're supposed to end, just indicates how um, you know how engaged people are on this topic and how they want to hear the answers to these questions. Um, I will just say remind people that our next webinar on this series of compost climate connections is October 23rd on the UC Davis uh, study, followed by November 6th on Soil Haiti, and then November 19th on basically carbon farming in Colorado uh, using some, um, you know, the tools that um, Cala Rose mentioned. So Cala Rose, thank you so much for this highly informative webinar. We look forward to following your work and the movement that you're helping to create here on this important topic. So, and just so grateful that you focused on the positive, you know, that soil, let us not forget that soil is a massive sink for carbon. And just one other thing I'll say, you're the second person who's mentioned Comp that I know of that compost is a gateway drug. The late great David Buckle back in 2013 was the first person who uh, I heard talk about that. So I couldn't agree with you more. So awesome. hopefully, Thank hopefully you. we'll get an addiction going with compost. That's an addiction we all could use. So well, again, the, mm -hmm. Thank you, the Institute of Local Self-Reliance and you, Brenda, for hosting this. Um, for anyone who's interested in more than nitty gritty details, I would say tune in to Mark Easter and Dan Mach. Mark is one of the creators of Comet Planner and the scientist who can answer all your super nerdy questions. Excellent. There you go. Have a great day, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye.